and an MS in environmental industrial hygiene. He's worked for Oregon OSHA for 23 years. He worked as a compliance officer for eight years and has been working as an industrial hygiene and ergonomics consultant for the past 15 years. Our other speaker is Matt Kaiser. Matt is an industrial hygienist and technical specialist who joined Oregon OSHA in 2016. Matt holds an, an, an honors uh, Bachelor of Science degree in microbiology and an MS graduate degree in molecular toxicology from Oregon State University. Before moving into the technical position in 2019, Matt was an Oregon OSHA compliance officer in the Portland field office. So we'd like to turn over our time today to our speakers today and, and, uh, and if, if we could all clap, we'd be clapping right now to welcome them and uh, begin our presentation. Yeah, <laughs> take it away. Good afternoon. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Michael, for helping this happen again. And um, if there are any attendees that were able to be present in the presentation from May, just wanted to make sure that it's known that this presentation is going to be slightly different. Uh, I think there'll be uh, more specific information that we may have questions about, uh, and especially some of the guidance that has uh, been issued recently. So we, we have a goal in this presentation to uh, share what Oregon OSHA has been up to. Um, we also want to be able to educate um, those that are our stakeholders that we work with and provide support for the ongoing efforts. Um, as always, and especially during this time um, when uh, the governor's task force has been leaning and working together with uh, Oregon OSHA uh, during this time to, to accomplish uh, moving through uh, this emergency. So um, if some of the topics are hit quickly during the presentation, um, just be patient with us and we'll try to provide lots of opportunities for questions. Um, so that's a little overview. Okay. So the highlights of today's presentation include, again, an overview of the updated guidance um, on statewide mask, face shield, and face covering use. Also wanted to just briefly mention um, the Oregon OSHA advisory memo uh, regarding the enforcement of face covering guidance. And then uh, maybe some have heard, uh, maybe not, this might be news to many, is um, Oregon OSHA has committed to some emergency rulemaking uh, for infectious disease for both the healthcare industry as well as the general workplace. Um, Matt is the, actually the Oregon OSHA technical section lead uh, for that effort. So he will have an opportunity to um, comment about that and respond to some questions if there are any. Uh, I want to touch again on an update in Oregon OSHA's interim guidance related to COVID-19 and then um, make sure that we're able to share what we've been up to as an agency recently. <clears throat> Oregon OSHA's mission is to advance and improve workplace safety and health for all workers in Oregon. And as many people know, um, Oregon OSHA has been quite active in uh, the response in the state. So historically, there are some activities that uh, Oregon OSHA has been involved in that are related to 
uh, the current um, COVID-19 emergency. Uh, as a matter of fact, Oregon OSHA has been addressing pathogens that lead to disease uh, specifically through, for example, the bloodborne pathogens standard. A few photographs that were available through the CDC um, on several viruses, hepatitis B, HIV, that's also addressed through bloodborne pathogens standard. Tuberculosis, while there's not a specific standard in Oregon to address TB, uh, there is a program directive um, that explains how the agency goes about um, addressing this in the workplace. And this one is of particular interest because of its ability to transmit in the air. A couple of other uh, images of the coronavirus that we're dealing with now. So just quickly, um, I think most people know SARS-CoV-2 is distinct from other coronaviruses. Uh, there are several coronaviruses um, that do cause the common cold, as we called it. In addition, there are other coronaviruses that have led to other outbreaks uh, recently over the past 10, 20 years. For example, severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, SARS is from coronavirus, as well as uh, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Yesterday, I went back to the CDC website to just make sure that um, I was passing along the current information on the understanding of how it spread. And uh, right now, this is what the CDC is saying is thought to spread mainly through close contact from person to person. In addition, there's recognition of um, contact with surfaces or objects. And as many people are probably aware, there is a debate, a very heated discussion right now in the scientific community about how contagious this virus is through aerosols. So keep that on your radar. July 1st, here is couple of images of the new daily cases of COVID-19. Uh, the upper image is the United States. The lower one is Oregon. So uh, I'm sure people are aware that, um, yes, in over, over 39 states, um, case, cases are increasing. Something that I think is valuable for us as safety and health professionals and uh, members of our community and uh, members in, in our workforce is the idea that public health and productivity truly are partners that are working together. I think the, the more effective that public health and industry can be supporting each of the efforts, uh, the more successful that our community in Oregon will be as we move through this time. So I was trying to illustrate the children in the photograph, one being representative of public health efforts and the other um, productivity and industry and they truly uh, can benefit from each other. Deborah Berkowitz, uh, Director of the Worker Safety Program at the National Employment Law Project, 
made a very good comment early in May. In this situation, protecting workers is more than just protecting an individual worker. It's protecting the public, it's protecting our communities. So let's uh, first just talk a little bit about uh, the update and the uh, face mask, face coverings guidance. Um, this is a quote from Governor Brown regarding the updated guidance from July 1st. I do not want to have to close businesses again like other states are now doing. If you want your local shops and restaurants to stay open, please wear a face mask covering one out. Please wear a face covering one out on the public. Um, it appears to me very clear that the governor's task force understands the importance of um, precautions as well as the importance of a thriving uh, economy here. Um, the new update applies to businesses, members of the public visiting indoor public spaces. Um, descriptions of people included employees, contractors, volunteers, customers, and visitors. Uh, it includes retailers as well as other public facing businesses statewide. This link will open up um, the document posted on the Oregon Health Authority uh, website. So briefly, here's a list that is included in that updated guidance for face coverings, grocery stores, fitness related organizations, pharmacies, restaurants, bars, breweries, brew pubs, retail stores, shopping centers, ride sharing services. And as you can see, a common um, thread through these businesses are most of these are activities where people are indoors. Um, of course, I'm sure most people attending today, like myself, have been back to their favorite restaurants and been back to their favorite taverns. Um, so during eating and drinking, of course, face covering not required. Um, in addition, not required when entering a location where the employee, contractor, or volunteer is not interacting with the public and the social distance can be maintained between other people. So that's another situation where the face covering is not required. And again, the guidance mentions face coverings not required during activities. That makes wearing a mask uh, not feasible, such as exercise, singing, playing an instrument. Again, the big if, if the social distance six feet can be maintained. Um, the guidance also includes people that should not be wearing face covers. Um, that includes children under the age of two. Of course, anyone who has a medical condition that makes it hard to breathe when wearing a face covering, as well as anyone who has a disability that prevents the individual from wearing a face covering. There's also a requirement to post signs um, about the mask, face shield, or face coverings. And this image is an example of what could be used. This was from the Oregon Health Authority. And I believe that email or that uh, web address is to that particular uh, poster that was created. So again, that's an example of signage that um, would be good to use. 
at various uh, businesses. So in response to the updated guidance by um, the governor's task force, Oregon OSHA has um, issued, at least internally, an advisory memo on enforcement of the Oregon Health Authority guidance. And so I'd like to quickly review that memo includes, the guidance includes businesses and others responsible for indoor spaces. So again, the emphasis on indoors. Um, there are several sectors uh, that have specific guidance for uh, practices. If customers or visitors are not wearing a mask or face cover, Oregon OSHA expects a business or other responsible or other person responsible for indoor spaces to politely ask the customer or visitor to wear a mask or face shield or face covering. Here's some best practices that uh, might work uh, if there's no face covering, uh, perhaps arrange to greet the customers upon entry so that the issue can be addressed uh, as they enter the indoor space. Consider keeping a supply of inexpensive disposable face coverings to offer customers or guests if they do not have one. Again, these are best practices that are recommended by Oregon OSHA. There's probably other uh, solutions that other companies and other organizations have found to work. If there's a condition where um, someone has a condition or disability that prohibit them from wearing the face mask, uh, consider offering them an accommodation, an alternative method that could still protect others um, in the location or ask them perhaps a face shield would be a suitable option. A best practice could be uh, to maintain a supply of face shields that could be a loan, and then of course, uh, sanitized between uses. So if an individual declines to wear a mask or face cover, the employer or the representative should politely inquire as to whether the person has a medical condition or disability that prevents them uh, from wearing face cover. If there's no relevant medical condition or disability, uh, but the individual refuses to answer or refuses to wear the face cover, politely let the person know that the employer or the organization cannot serve them and that they need to leave the premises. Please do not make an effort to physically block an individual um, from entering or try to physically remove them. Um, I think most organizations and most businesses has a plan or a procedure um, that could be used for individuals that uh, refuse to leave. So Oregon OSHA would ask that employers follow their, their regular plan in those situations. Uh, a best practice could be to offer the same options um, to the visitor or the customer outside the business um, instead of inside. Another best practice that uh, Oregon OSHA is recommending is that uh, if there are individuals that they're indicating they're having a difficulty hearing or understanding, then perhaps step farther away, ensure extra space between the customer or um, member of the public, and then move, remove the mask um, during that point of communication and then uh, replace that as possible. 
So Oregon OSHA has been asked by the governor to educate the public about uh, this updated guidance uh, for face coverings and has asked uh, Oregon OSHA to um, enforce this updated guidance. And um, the administrator for the agency has said that um, July 8th would be the date where uh, there could be enforcement activities uh, if there's a situation that needs to be addressed. Um, so that's a date uh, that is important in this new effort. So that's the um, close of the presentation for the updated face mask and face covering guidance. And so now I'd like to move on to an updated uh, guidance from Oregon OSHA related to COVID-19. Again, it was updated June 29th. First and foremost, Please remember, even during this emergency, that it is the employer's responsibility to ensure that employees are adequately protected uh, from hazards at their workplaces. This expectation has not changed. Specifically in this guidance posted on Oregon OSHA's website, there is mention of initial training. If, if there's in-house training that is typically done, for example, hazard communication, uh, silica training, or other in-house training, Oregon OSHA would expect that to continue as normal, uh, taking into consideration uh, precautions, uh, such as social distancing, using teleconferencing as, as possible. for annual training or operator certifications that became due after March 1st, um, Oregon OSHA will be accepting your declaration that uh, such training is not feasible uh, and therefore will not cite it until the, the, this particular memo is rescinded. If there are recertifications and annual testing um, that would expire after March 1st, again, that's another situation where if uh, it involves an outside expertise or other provider that um, an employer's declaration that such training is not feasible, uh, therefore Oregon OSHA uh, would accept that and not, not cite that. However, please keep in mind that if there are recertifications and annual testing that are in-house performed by employees, then the agency expects that to occur. So there are other comments about annual and periodic medical monitoring, such as audiograms, uh, blood lead level testing. Um, there is comment about uh, annual respirator fit testing, providing some flexibility in um, enforcement in those areas. For initial medical monitoring and fit testing, uh, please, um, continue to do that to your greatest extent. Again, uh, genuine feasibility and the greater hazard would be considered in uh, any enforcement types of questions. But it's important to at least try to safely accomplish the initial medical monitoring and initial fit testing. There is specific uh, paragraph about annual confined space rescue training. 
um, and that is to maintain that training uh, while following um, work guidance for the COVID-19. And for agricultural labor housing, um, Oregon OSHA staff have been working on uh, performing their reviews of, of the applications without on-site visit that is normally required. There are also uh, comments in the interim guidance regarding safety committees and safety meetings. Um, Oregon OSHA expects employers to continue holding safety committee meetings and um, certainly would hope that um, employers are following alternatives to meetings in person. So, Oregon OSHA will not be enforcing uh, the, the quarterly inspection requirement um, after March 1st, as long as there's some system in place for employees to report hazards and some way to evaluate those hazards that have been reported and to be able to follow up on those. There's been lots of innovation in industry already and um, Oregon OSHA appreciates that and uh, we'll do everything, uh, you know, that we can to help with finding solutions. Some additional language, um, if you as an employer, um, you do your good faith effort uh, to determine how to have an alternative to an in-person meeting, but can not identify a way to do it, um, Oregon OSHA would allow for a suspension after March 1st, um, as long as the following criteria are met. Again, have a way for employees to report hazards, be sure that those hazards are evaluated, um, continue excellent and clear communication with employees, including the safety committee members, and uh, maintain a list uh, of those issues and hazards that were reported so that uh, they can be evaluated as soon as possible. So again, this memo is posted on Oregon OSHA's public website uh, that was updated on June 29th. And it says the citation guidance will be in effect until a sufficient number of Oregon counties has entered into phase three, and it's evident that the elements addressed become sufficiently available. So um, my recommendation is to keep an eye on Oregon OSHA's website for updated uh, guidance. So at this time, I'd like to transition to an explanation of the current infectious disease rulemaking. And Matt will um, be speaking on this in just a moment. So if you have a couple questions, uh, feel free to bring those up either at this time or at the end of the presentation would be fine. California, in 2009 adopted the aerosol transmissible disease standard and it was specific for the healthcare industry. So this has been done before And I'm going to do a quick overview and I'll let, um, I'll let Matt correct me if I misstate. So the goal is to, over the summer, 
develop an emergency um, infectious disease rule um, that would be in effect by September, and that would be for uh, healthcare as well as the general workplace. And the long-term goal at this point would be to possibly have a permanent infectious disease rule that could go in effect in the spring of 2021. And it's my understanding at that point in the spring of 2021, there will be a decision made on either to adopt permanent rules for infectious disease or modify um, the rule that is available or withdraw those rules. Oregon OSHA does have a section of their website which is um, called Upcoming Rulemaking. So keep an eye on that page uh, if you want to uh, find out more about it. I'm not certain if information has been posted at this time, but um, that is some a web page that I wanted to um, make sure that I announced. And last week when I read the information, uh, this week, um, the effort is to begin external stakeholder meetings um, so that there can be discussions of a temporary rule. Um, and the other important date, as I saw it, was September 1st. Uh, the plan is to um, adopt and make September 1st as the effective date of the temporary infectious disease rules. And then again, spring 2021, the goal is to make a decision. And that decision being either to adopt, modify, or withdraw one or both of the rules. And, and the information that I was provided, um, the titles that were being used were airborne infectious disease and healthcare and airborne infectious disease in the general workplace. So at this time, I'd like to pass the microphone over to Matt um, to make some comments that he think would be, uh, would be pertinent at this time. So Matt. I'm here, can you hear me, Nate? Yes. All right, thank you for that introduction to our rulemaking process. I uh, just wanted to say real quickly, I'm sure Nate said it ahead of time, uh, but we're more than happy to be here, happy to be uh, participating in this type of meeting and presentation. I did send in the chat my contact information to anyone, any of the participants in today's meeting, if they are interested in receiving updates or participating in the rulemaking process itself, uh, to go ahead and send me an email um, directly. But uh, I, I think Nate really covered all the major points Essentially what Oregon OSHA is doing is we are doing rule making for four individual rules, two of which are gonna be emergency rules or what we call an OSHA, Emergency Temporary Standards, ETS. And those are um, scheduled to go into effect in um, as soon as September 1st. And then the second round of room rulemaking is planned to occur in the spring of 2021. Um, and that would be a non ETS standard, but something what we would call a permanent rule um, that will likely be based off parts of the temporary rules or the emergency rules that we um, adopt in the spring this or sorry, this fall, September 1st. So again, four different sets of rules and lots of rulemaking ahead of us here at Oregon OSHA in our technical section. But for anyone who is interested, whether they're coming from maybe a health healthcare setting or they're something that's not in healthcare, but that is likely to be impacted by this particular rulemaking process, if they have any questions or concerns or wanna be involved in that process, I again, wanted to make sure that I provided my contact information because we would love to have as much participation and feedback from uh, employers as well as labor groups uh, as much as possible. 
Um, and uh, at that point, I'll, I'll wait until there are more specific questions about the, about the process, um, and we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Matt, for that um, information. That's good to know. I know employers in Oregon always want to um, be prepared when new things happen um, in this area. So again, feel free to reach out to Matt. He is the lead from um, the technical section in Oregon OSHA. And uh, I've been working with Matt especially closely this spring and I will say he does a great job, um, is highly capable, and um, I think uh, it's going to be good for that process. So I'd like to continue with uh, a little overview of the response of Oregon OSHA. Um, this information um, is somewhat dated, just a review of executive orders um, issued by the governor March, mid-March and late March, everybody is familiar with at this point. Uh, at that time, um, we were working to flatten the curve. So try to lower the number of cases so that our healthcare system um, has the capacity to provide the important healthcare that needs to be available. Uh, of course, we're still working on that. Um, we are across the country. I just heard information this morning on the news about the struggles that uh, Houston, Texas are having in this area. I heard a comparison to uh, what New York City was uh, dealing with um, early on in the situation. So uh, this is still very much important. Um, Oregon OSHA was involved with responding by answering phone calls um, there in March and April and May, Oregon OSHA received concerns and complaints. The figure that I last heard was nearly 5,000 phone calls. And that's in perhaps two to three months time, uh, just to describe that workload Generally, Oregon OSHA has received about 5,000 phone calls with questions and complaints um, in 12 months' time. So uh, many people, many of us were um, taking on new roles, uh, trying to serve the public in this new dynamic. Oftentimes, when the complaint would come in, um, we really saw that as an opportunity to reach out to our employers to uh, provide some education and provide some support and really help with their efforts um, that uh, our public health officials have been providing guidance on. So I've got coworkers who have been in touch with, um, with dozens and dozens of employers uh, providing abatement assistance, helping find guidance provided by industry groups, uh, gu guidance from the CDC, guidance from Oregon Health Division. There were several, at least two Oregon OSHA staff that were involved with evaluating the PPE that was uh, being provided and uh, obtained by uh, the state of Oregon for the state stockpile. Um, that's another area of response that Oregon OSHA has been involved in. Uh, people probably are aware with the international respirator 
um, situation that the FDA and NIOSH has identified with some of those not being up to standard um, as to um, what the claim was. So that was very critical that um, we were able to evaluate PPE as it was coming in. Additional temporary rulemaking that was completed by the agency was uh, for the agriculture and specifically uh, in the labor housing area. Coworkers have also been involved with the reopening and restarting um, our industry. For instance, there is task force that um, includes specific my manager in the Portland field office, as well as members from our staff from Oregon Health Authority and the Department of Ag uh, to provide support to the food processing industry. There were field staff uh, from across various office that were involved with um, a task force to support construction. Um, there are several individuals involved with the uh, Willamette Valley Wineries Association in helping develop guidelines for wine tasting room operations. Uh, this morning, I was out in Newburgh with uh, a group at a vineyard. Again, the wine industry uh, innovating and really working on solutions that will protect employees and protect the public uh, at the same time as they continue uh, their work. Um, Oregon OSHA has been able to provide input on occupational safety and health measures. For instance, uh, we have worked closely with the Oregon Health Authority on um, their guidance for strategies of PPE use, um, especially for healthcare industry, which includes uh, dental offices. Um, our agency is working on some joint guidance uh, for dental offices, and hopefully that will be published within the next, I hate to say a date, but I'm gonna say it, hopefully within the next week or two. Uh, I have high confidence that uh, those documents will be uh, published. And the idea is providing guidance on the best way that, uh, especially healthcare um, employers can perform, especially emergency type procedures and elective type procedures while there are shortages in the PPE supply. Um, we have also provided input on uh, guidance for restaurants, bars, and brew pubs for outdoor recreation, as well as other uh, business sectors. Last week, I was able to hear an update from one of, actually a couple of the enforcement managers out of the central office, and as part of the agency's response, Along with consultative service, there have been enforcement activities. And um, for example, there were at least three willful violations that were alleged um, by enforcement. Um, and Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, um, those were situations where that, that was unusual where there's very clear guidance and for some reason those were just not followed. That's not the norm. Uh, nevertheless, um, the governor's task force has asked Oregon OSHA to play a role in holding people accountable. And again, last week, there was a specific mention of this agency, um, again, being used to educate the public, but also enforcing um, the guidance that has been issued 
specifically for use of face coverings. So consultative services has been providing uh, remote consultations and as well as some on-site consultations. At this point, the on-site visits that I'm familiar with and that we've been uh, provided guidance on has been uh, for outdoor type of uh, settings or perhaps if they're indoor, an indoor setting that might be sort of uh, a warehouse type building with a large space and a low number of occupants. Um, we've been providing abatement assistance for organizations and for companies as they work to um, follow guidance that has been issued from public health agencies. Uh, we've been providing information about best practices and interim requirements for several different uh, industries and business sectors such as construction, uh, recycling, facilities, utilities. Ongoing services that Oregon OSHA has been involved in include coordinating with the Oregon Emergency Management. We've been an information source uh, for companies across the state. And again, as, as we move through these times of reopening, I'd uh, just like to reiterate the value of working together with public health, um, how both public health efforts as well as industry will uh, benefit from um, working hand in hand. Uh, we ask that employees remember that it's the governor's office that will announce when sectors will be allowed to reopen. Oregon OSHA does not approve sectors for reopening. Uh, certainly we can help find those answers. So feel free to reach out to us um, if there's uh, information that you're seeking and we'll do our best to help find those answers. Businesses that were ordered to stop us operations must wait until Governor Brown gives the go ahead. This is from the Oregon Health Authority website from yesterday. Um, its date was June 19th. And the counties in the bluish green color were approved for phase two as of June 19th, which is most of the state, while there are a few counties still in phase one, Multnomah County, Washington County, Clackamas, Lincoln County. And just wanted to briefly mention resources that uh, are dependable uh, that we find have been useful, of course, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, the Oregon Health Authority, Oregon OSHA has a web page to address issues with COVID-19, Federal OSHA does as well. And please remember the value and the importance of the local public health departments uh, at the county level, they are the organizations that will be knowledgeable of what's happening in, happening in your community. So we rely on the local public health departments um, immensely. And uh, we just want to, again, remind uh, folks of their guidance. There was a question that came to us several weeks ago that uh, we were able to confirm. And the question was, if I as an employer 
have had an employee that has been working at my establishment for a week or two or however long, and one day calls and said, well, now I've been confirmed as uh, positive for COVID-19. Can I continue working? Do I need to close? What do I need to do? And Oregon OSHA expects employers that find themselves in that situation to reach out to their local public health departments and follow their guidance. So again, if you as an employer have a coworker or an employee that turns out to be positive, reach out to your county health department and ask them for guidance use their support because um, they really have their eye on what's happening locally in the community. Another tremendous resource has been industry associations and trade groups. Um, it's been quite impressive to see the innovation uh, across industries uh, during this time on how we can adapt to the situation and continue to thrive. So um, definitely reach out to the various trade groups and associations for, um, for support. There is, unless something has changed recently, the Battelle system in Eugene for decontaminating filtering face piece respirators. And the comment that I have about this is if you are in a situation where you're using that system or you're thinking about using that system, just keep in mind that the manufacturer of the respirator must say that system is compatible for that respirator. So if you're looking at using that Battelle system, I would recommend going to the respirator manufacturer's website or calling up the manufacturer and asking if your, your specific uh, filtering face piece respirator is compatible with that system. So that is uh, the extent of the presentation that I have at this time. And um, there is the link at the bottom of this slide to reach out to Matt and others in the technical section. It looks like we have about 10 minutes, so now is a great time uh, for questions that might um, be around. So, Michael, should uh, maybe you would be best to take control yeah. at this time. I'm happy to facilitate. So the first question we had was from David, and you think you kind of touched on it, but he's basically asking about uh, if people have a medical reason for not wearing the mask, that the media has stated that uh, uh, in the news, they've talked about if you have a medical reason, you don't have to wear one. And the, the question is if, if, uh, if they don't want to wear one, if they say they have a medical reason, do you still have to ask them to leave. So would you restate that again, the question? Yeah, if somebody states that they have a medical condition for not wearing a mask and, um, and there isn't a face shield available, and uh, do, you know, do you still have to ask them to leave or are you uh, able to just let them come in because they have a medical reason not to wear the mask? It's my understanding that Oregon OSHA would ask that business to provide service outdoor if possible. Uh, Matt, do you have comment on this particular question? Um, so Oregon OSHA would expect that, so imagining it's a person, a member of a public and not an employee who's asking for this, um, request not to wear a mask. So the big word is accommodation. 
So, you know, we want to try and give this person, if they can't wear a face covering, such as a cloth face covering, one of the best practices might be to have sanitizable face coverings or uh, face shields, sorry, for those, for those people who either have a medical reason or feel uncomfortable wearing the mask. But with that said, the expectation is that if you, have, if you are an employer and you are presented with a situation where you have a customer who is not abiding by the face covering uh, requirements, that you very politely but clearly state that you're going to be unable to serve them. Um, and as Nate went over, we in no way want people to physically remove people from the premises. And if you do encounter a situation where someone is deciding to make a spectacle of not being allowed to be served, um, you know, what we would say from Morgan OSHA is what are your internal policies for handling disgruntled customers at your site? So the default is always to call the police. I mean, if you have someone who is refusing to vacate your premises after being asked to leave, they're essentially trespassing at that particular point. So don't forget that if you are faced with an issue like this, hopefully it doesn't escalate to that point, but there is that final fallback. Um, but Oregon OSHA's expectation again is that employers will hold people of the public who are coming into their establishment accountable for adhering to this policy. Thank you, Matt, for that uh, response. And, you know, again, we are trying to find ways to help employers continue business. So um, I would encourage people that are finding themselves dealing with this question to find an alternative way to provide uh, services to your customers or to the members of your organization. Um, you know, can can something be done outside, especially during the summer months? Um, can uh, can barriers be used? Um, can things be done differently? Reach out to your networks and look for ways to do things differently during this time, especially. So I guess just to follow up on, on that question, um, there's been a couple more clarification questions. So employers do have the right to ask if somebody has a medical condition if they're not wearing a face covering, correct? Sure. But and, not and the if, specific condition itself. Um, exactly. I just wanted to throw in that clarification. You can't ask, hey, Bob, <laughs> you're saying you have a, a medical exemption. What is the medical exemption specifically? Of course, you can't do that. As an employer. Exactly. Exactly. And and if they do have a medical condition that would prohibit them from wearing a face covering, are they allowed? I don't know that that was clear in either one of your answers. Are they allowed to come in without a face covering, or do you have to accommodate them with a face shield or something else? Or so it gets it gets tricky fast. Um, but the the buzzword again is accommodation so oregon osha would expect that the employer make a good faith accommodation to provide that employee with either alternative protective equipment or put them in a job position that removes the hazard so if the hazard in this case is uh covid 19 exposure is it possible to have this person work remotely is it possible to put them in a private office is it possible to remove the potential hazards that we would associate with covid 19 transmission in the workplace Gotcha. We've had a couple more questions. Let me pull them up here. Sorry. Um, several lo local grocery store managers in our county feel there are not enough internal resources, extra staff to serve as greeters at the entrances to remind customers to wear masks, address medical concerns, etc. While their employees do not want to get infected, they also do not want to be the police leaving the stores without someone to guide customers towards conformity question is how will employers concerns be addressed is that clear i'm not i'm a little confused by it uh, i'm happy to jump in unless you want to take a stab there nate but yeah, um, go ahead, I, Matt. Mean, I would say a lot of it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis i mean every storefront's going to be a little different um, so there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all uh, approach per se, but of course there are signs that CDC has uh, developed posters that can be printed and then posted on uh, areas of ingress and egress 
Um, I've seen different stores take essentially like a mannequin and dress it up, put a mask on it, and then have it holding a sign that says, make sure you're wearing a mask or a face covering before you enter, and they place that mannequin right outside the main entrance. And so there, there's room for flexibility, and that's how Oregon OSHA would approach an employer, or if, say, we got a complaint, um, related to this particular topic, Oregon OSHA would, you know, provide employers with a lot of flexibility. Um, yeah, we, we don't want employees to necessarily feel like they have to be the police. We would want there to be in the way of signage and non-human related, <laughs> um, I, I guess I would say triggers. Like we would want to try and make it abundantly obvious that the expectation coming into this establishment is that all members of the public, just like our employees, are going to be wearing face coverings. And um, to then provide contact information, possibly, if you want to, for customers who might have questions or concerns related to that. But again, there's not one set method that Oregon OSHA says you have to do it just this way and no other variation. It's, we're going to provide a lot of flexibility to employers to try and tackle it in the way that makes sense for their business and their, their clientele. And feel free to blame Oregon OSHA. Oregon OSHA told me to do this. We're used to that. Super. <laughs> or, or I would also, you know, recommend engaging with our consultation staff. This is one of those great examples of where our consultants are very familiar with the current guidance. They've seen a lot of different employers' approaches to similar issues. And in that, they are a wealth of troubleshooting, best practices, and all around OSHA compliance related info. So I heavily advertise that route because it's free and it's confidential and employers can ask very site specific questions related to the hazards or the concerns that they have at their site. So really a good chance to engage with Oregon OSHA's consultation services or your, your workers comp carrier likely also has on staff uh, safety and health professionals who can help guide employers through those site specific concerns they may have. Super, thank you. A couple more questions. Um, is there a requirement for, I'm assuming he's asking, he says face guards, sneeze guards. I'm assuming he's asking about plexiglass shields at registered checkout areas. I don't know of a requirement for that. Um, I think it's a great idea. Matt, have you seen a requirement for that? To my knowledge, um, and of course, as Nate has put out earlier, I mean, guidance is changing day to day, but to my knowledge, the only real requirement in Oregon currently for installation of plexiglass barriers or similar barriers is for restaurants that are trying to have in-person um, or on-site consumption of, of beverages or food. Um, but like Nate said, that doesn't mean an employer can't install uh, plexiglass barriers in different high, high hazard uh, work areas, such as checkout stands and things like that. So again, broad flexibility. There's not a requirement that says you must, as a grocer or a retail um, store owner, to my knowledge right now, that you must develop and install barriers that meet either these dimensions or this criteria. It's very flexible. Oregon OSHA is very flexible in that regard. Super, thank you. Last question, then we're at the end of our hour here. Uh, if you are a business with no public interaction and are able to socially distance in the facility, are employees required to wear masks? No, that was addressed in uh, the guidance that was published, I believe, on the 30th or the 1st? It is the 30th, Nate, that guidance okay. document from the Oregon Health and, Authority. Right, from the OHA, and I'm going to try to find that. I can post it in the, the chat if that would be helpful for people, that particular guidance document. Yeah, that'd document. be great, Matt. That would be great. Okay, I, so, I do remember you, so you, you here, said, you, yeah, there you are. So here, not required when at or in a location where the employee, contractor, or volunteer is not interacting with the public. So that's the key, one key is they're not interacting with the public. 
and six or more feet of distance can be maintained between other people. Super, thanks. I think that was the end and it looks like Matt shared a link to that guidance. Right. Uh, I will, I will uh, download that and post it to our website when we're done. All right. Well, thank you, thank you Michael. I really, really appreciate you sharing your expertise again. This was uh, fabulous and I hope it was helpful to everybody. And we will have this recording up on our website soon with the uh, handouts as well. So thanks again for everything. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And feel free to reach out to us if there are questions ongoing.